Welcome to Westwind Web Search. Web Search is a small utility to stress test web applications to make it very easy for you to capture requests and then play them back under load so that you can test your applications frequently and see what their load characteristics are. Let's get started. When we start Westwind Web Search for the first time, we come up with an empty environment. Web Search works with the concept of sessions, which is a collection of URLs that are used to run an individual test. There's a number of ways you can create sessions. One of them is to create a new request. You can capture a request by monitoring a browser or a Windows application. And you can also load sessions from file. These files are plain text files that essentially contain HTTP headers, or you can actually export them from tools like Fiddler. For now, let's start with a manually created request that we can run. So when I click the new button here, or click this button, we essentially get a new request created for us. A request is a URL along with some headers. So in this case, I'm gonna point it at my local web lock, which is a development site. So when I save this, I've now actually created a request. I can right click here and say test, and it will go out and now hit that URL and return the HTTP response to me. So it gives us the information of what was sent, the headers basically, and the actual HTTP headers that were returned, as well as the actual response. If the response was encoded in some format like gzip, it's automatically decoded and you can see the full HTTP response here. So if we now want to actually run this, we can go ahead and hit the start button. And when we do, what will happen is it will run for 30 seconds and 10 simultaneous threads, which means it's going to be running 10 simultaneous uh, sessions of the URL or URLs that I have configured here. Okay, so let's do that with the single thread here. And I'm gonna bump this actually to 20, so we have a little bit more. And you can see here that on the right side now, we have a console window that shows us all the requests as they're happening. Okay, so right now we only have a single URL. If we had multiples, we would see all those URLs firing and showing up in this window. On the bottom here, we can see a running total of the requests that are being run. So it shows us the number of requests, the number of requests that have failed, and then it shows us where it is in the processing of the request and a request per second total for the requests that have occurred. When the test is done, like it is right now, we get a final total that shows us how many requests were run, how many threads we were running simultaneously, how long it was run, and then again, that request per second total that tells us the key information about how many requests we were able to process in the time that we had. So this is single request processing and it's very easy to set up. If you need to capture more than a single URL, the URL capture form is a great way to do it. This form allows you to capture HTTP requests for any application on your machine, including a web browser. So you can browse through a site and capture the URLs as you're doing so. In order to do this, let's click on the capture button here and bring up our browser and then navigate to the page that you wanna capture. Okay, so you can see here, even before I start browsing around a lot, we're getting a lot of requests there. So let's do this for a second here. Let's go in and let's navigate around here. Let's go to a time report and let's fire off a report request with the post operation. And there we go, there's our report. Now, if I go back over here, I can stop the capture and we can see what we actually captured. So in order to actually use this, I can save it to disk. I can say um, time tracker. And when I do this, we can see in the background here that it's captured all of this information. Now what's interesting is, is that there's a bunch of garbage in here. You notice here's a Google link. Uh, these are coming from Chrome actually and the preview search box. So that's, that's crap that we're not interested in. Um, in other situations, you may have other things that you might not be interested in like Google Analytics, a CDN, uh, social links that you include data from. So anything that is external from your site, so it's probably not something that you're interested in. So one easy way to clean this up is you can simply select them all and press delete. So now I just have the things that I'm really interested in, but there's actually an easier way to do this without cleaning up the content first. So let's uh, close this session and let's run the capture again. Let's apply some filters instead. So the first thing I can do here is I can apply a filter for localhost. So this will remove anything that is external from our site. So this means I don't have to worry about the Chrome search box or any external links like Google Analytics or AdView or any CDN links. Additionally, I can click this checkbox here that basically allows me to ignore images, CSS and JavaScript links, as well as any filters that you set up in the configuration file. 
Basically, this allows you to filter out content that you're not interested in. Let's do this again. Let's click the capture box and let's go back to our site. Now, when we run this, you can see that it's much more sensible. We'll only see the things that we're typically interested in, which is the individual items. Okay, so we'll go back to our report here. I'll also put that one in so we get a post operation and let's get both and hit run. So now if we stop the capture, we can see that we have a much more sensible view of things that we have captured here. We've captured basically the main pages as well as some Ajax requests, but for the most part, we're dealing just with context that we're actually interested in. So again, I'm going to open this, timetracker.txt. I'm going to save this to disk. So the save operation is what actually opens it up then in the web search window here. And now you can see we have a much cleaner view. Now that we've imported this data, we can see the actual requests just as they are going to be played when we run them. So you can see here some post data. This is actually an Ajax request that was captured. So you can see the application JSON request. And then here's a post operation for the report, for example. So if I want to run this now, all I have to do is click the Start button. And let's go ahead and do that. And there's our report running. And you can see here, it's running and generating 170 requests a second, which is pretty good. Okay, and we can let this run. Now, at any point in time, you can stop this uh, test and you'll get a running total up to that point. So it told me that it ran 2,000 requests on 20 threads in 12 seconds and it ran 172 requests a second. We can quickly take a look and see what happened here by looking at the charts. And this tells us the requests per second. Then we can also look at individual requests and we can look at this chart, time taken by URL. And this basically tells me how long each one of the requests for that particular URL took. You can also look at the request per second for that single URL. Additionally, you can also export the data to let's say JSON. So if I wanna save that, it'll take a second. And there's my request exported as a JSON file. Now you want to be careful with this. If you got millions of requests, obviously these kind of imports are going to be problematic, but it gives you the ability to export to XML to JSON and let's do the XML export. And then that should come up in the browser. But as you can see, even with this relatively small request, it gets pretty slow to render this. So you would probably want to open this in a text file rather than the browser. So this is every request that was run and the results that are returned from it. Again, don't try this on really large lists. This only works for a few thousand. So if you do this on shorter tests, it will definitely work. But on really long tests, it will be a problem as the files will simply be too large to do anything useful with. Once you have an active session list of uh, requests, of URL requests, there's a number of ways you can manipulate it. We've already seen that we can manually create sessions and we can capture sessions. Sessions are stored in files, so any time after you've modified this, you can save any of these sessions and give them a file name and save them. So this is now just saved all of these, and we can then edit this and actually look at our session file. As you can see, the session file is nothing more than plain text, but you can also write and edit this file and update the information right here. So if you look closely here in this element, um, if we save, you can see that this value is immediately updating. So any changes that you make here are reflected back into the list over here. So this list is actually modifying the file and that's reflected over here. Now that I've created this, I've actually created a bogus entry here. So if we run this test now, we should see some errors. And indeed, if we look down here, you see that the um, summary is showing in red and it's showing us a fair amount of failed requests. If we look at the summary now, we'll see that there's a bunch of failed requests. And if we look at the actual list of results, we see a bunch of errors here. So there's a 500 error, which is the actual Ajax calls are failing. And that's probably because we're looking at invalid IDs at this point. And then there's also the 404s for the file not found for the bogus link. And then I can click here and actually go to this and this will show me maybe more information in the browser. So far, we've only been running requests that are relatively slow and generating like a few hundred requests a second, which is pretty mellow and easy to handle. However, if you're running something that is much more high volume, we need to consider a few other things. So I'm pulling up here another session that has a, a web API endpoint that is very, very quick. If I run this, we can see we're generating thousands of requests a second. So we've already generated 20,000 requests here of this particular request. But if you also look closely, you'll notice 
that the number is slowly dropping. We're down to 2,800 requests a second. And as you keep going, the number keeps stopping. So the problem here is that the UI actually has problems keeping up. So Web Search has an options page that allows you to configure a few options on startup. The one that we're interested in here is the no progress events option, which you can also set over here in this UI. And basically what this will do is it will disable those messages and simply output the summary events and then give you a final result. So if I run this again now, we can see here that the console window now stays black because there are no updates being fired to it. But if we look at the bottom here, we can see that the uh, requests are indeed firing and we're getting much better requests per second results down here at the bottom. So now the number is actually staying fairly steady, which means the UI was actually what was slowing us down earlier. The options page has a number of options on it that are important and that I would like to go over. The first one is delay time MS, which is the interval between individual requests that is waited before the next one is fired. By default, this value is zero, and this is how we've been running our requests. And basically what this means is that requests fire exactly one after the other. This is not like a user typically, because users typically have some time to think before they click on the next thing. So if you want a scenario for load testing, then zero is great because it allows you to send as many requests as possible at the server until you break the server or you get to a point where it's overloaded. So then you start backing off the number simultaneous threat to find the rough load points. The other alternative is you simulate users, in which case you insert a delay. So a typical user will take at least a second usually, or maybe a little bit less. So let's say 750 milliseconds. And then let's assume for a second that we have 200 users on our site for testing. So if I run this again now um, and start, notice what happens here. The request count is way lower than it was before because now we have this delay in there for 750 milliseconds. Where before we had almost 7,000 requests, we now have, even though we have 200 simultaneous users with some wait time, we only generate 277 or 275 requests a second. So this is how the wait time actually affects it. And this is very useful. It gives you different options for testing. I mean, ultimately, we're still having a certain amount of traffic that is being pushed, but the delay is actually slowing things down and it is one other way for you to look at individual requests hitting your web server. The other thing that we already looked at is the no progress events. Again, if you're running high volume requests, you wanna set this to true. And again, there's a flag here as well. You can also randomize requests. So when we look at individual requests here, by default, they are executed in the order that they are loaded. So here is a list and each one of these requests will be fired one after the other. And then a new session is started on a new thread every time. So what happens is that when we first start out, we get blocks of each one of these requests coming in at the same time. So there'll be 10 of these being fired because all threads simultaneously now firing the same order. By randomizing requests, we're basically outlaying that. So you can set this value to true, and when you do, the requests are completely randomized, and so your load profile for the individual requests will be completely random. The request timeout is the timeout in milliseconds when a request is considered failed. So this is we'll wait for three seconds. Warm-up seconds is a nice parameter that is used to allow the web server to warm up a little bit. So if you're starting from a cold start, you probably want to make this value a lot bigger. But if you start doing a warm start like I've been doing, then two seconds is probably enough. The number of seconds that you use here are added to the test. And then later off, all these requests that were fired in the warm up period are stripped from the actual results. The last thing I'd like to show is the command line integration. Um, web search ships with a CLI version. Um, so you can basically uh, just put web search CLI on the command line. And that was made available as part of the installer. And so what we can do is with that is we can specify a URL or a session file. Um, and just have it run basically. So I can say T10, so 10 threads. And if I do this, it will now do all of this from the command line basically. So it'll give me that same progress information that we saw earlier on the um, status bar. So once it's done, it's gonna give me the summary just as before. You can also run this without any command line interface so that there's no progress information. And if you do this, it's gonna run silently except for the startup banner and the result value being displayed. So this is great for integration into a build process or test process. So you could run a test for you know, five or 10 seconds and see whether any requests are failing. 
Thank you for watching this video about Western Web Search. If you'd like to find out more, please come and visit us at west-wind.com slash web search. You can download a free copy of Web Search and get started. Thanks again for watching.